the Motivic Geometry Seminar. And today, um, our first speaker is Mark Oiva, who will give his first lecture in a series of three talks on frame correspondences. Yes, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much, uh, for the, the invitation uh, to speak. So, um, yeah, so these three series of lectures is an introduction to frame correspondences. Um, and um, it's based on joint work. Well, it's based on work of many people, including uh, joint work with Eldon Elmanto, Adil Khan, Vladimir Sosnilo, and Maria Jakerson. And um, we, uh, our work itself builds on uh, earlier work of um, Garkusha, Panin, Ananyevsky, and Neshita. And um, well, and I guess a lot of the ideas actually go back to uh, Vojvodsky from the early 2000s or so. Um, <clears throat> right, so I want to um, ask the, the following two uh, motivating questions to frame the discussion. Um, so first question is what kind of transfers do cohomology theories represented by motivic spectra have? And the second question is, is every cohomology theory with these transfers, whatever they are, represented by a material spectrum? Um, right, so I think both of these questions are quite interesting. And I mean, the first question um, uh, also in the classical topology was, has been a very interesting question and uh, there's been a lot of work um, in motivic cohomology theory about this and um, now Recently, we basically now have the ultimate answer to this question. And so I will explain uh, what that is. And then, um, yeah, the second question uh, is a bit stranger maybe, but um, it's motivated by the fact that in, in uh, ordinary topology, the, the answer to the second question is yes. Um, and it, which is more or less a classical, classical result, but um, yeah, formulating precisely um, this result, maybe, well, as, as we'll see, it benefits a lot from, from higher category theory, so. Um, right, so basically the plan, well, today is like an introduction to the introduction, I guess, but I will, um, um, I, I'm going to talk basically about the, answer the first question and tell you what these transfers are. And then tomorrow, um, I'll talk about the recognition principle which is the answer to the second question. And then um, on Monday, I will say something about uh, algebraic cobordism. So that's the plan. And um, okay, now before talking about motivic things, though, I want to recall uh, what, what is going on um, in ordinary topology. So maybe you want to talk about analogs um, of these questions for ordinary spectra. Um, okay, so just some notation. Um, I'm going to let man be the category of manifolds, of smooth manifolds. And SPC, this will mean the infinity category of spaces. Right, so when I, uh, when I use the word space, it will always be in that sense. So it means like an object in this infinity category, so an infinity group or you do something like this. If I want to refer to topological space, I will say uh, topological space. Um, right, so I will take a very liberal definition of what I mean by cohomology theory in this context, which is the following. So cohomology theory on uh, manifolds is a functor a contrarian functor um, valued in spaces manifolds to spaces um, which satisfies so let's call this f satisfying uh, only two conditions uh, so the first condition is uh, descent for open covers. Uh, so this is basically my aviatorious condition. Um, at least if you have uh, 
or if you have a, an open cover by two open subsets, it's just a Mayavia-Torres property, but uh, you could have infinite open covers as well. And then um, homotopy invariance. Um, which means that uh, for every manifold M, um, if I pull back from M to M times um, the real line, this should be an uh, isomorphism. All right, and then, um, so the point is now we have actually a simple classification of these cohomology theories, which is the following theorem. So this is um, heidenberg stenwald type um, classification of these things. So um, if you look at uh, the infinity category of all cohomology theories in the, the above sense, um, So if I have a, such a cohomology theory, I can just evaluate on the point, yeah? And I get the space, and this evaluation functor is actually equivalent. Um, so let me say a few words about why this is true. So this is, um, yeah, so this is not, very difficult to see. Um, so the first thing to note is that this evaluation functor it has a left adjoint, which takes um, takes a space and sends it to the constant sheaf. So uh, there's a left adjoint. Uh, the constant sheaf functor. So it sends x to. Um, the pre sheaf of a manifold, which sends a manifold M to, well, the global sections of the constant sheaves. But um, then there's a computation that you can do that if you take the manifold M and you look at the constant sheaf of spaces with value X on this manifold, then the space of global sections is the same as this mapping space um, from M to X. So this is not completely formal fact. It uses the fact that manifolds are um, nice topological spaces, yeah, locally contractible and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, so that's an elementary computation. So the constant sheaf looks like this. In particular, you see that uh, from this formula, it's clear that this constant sheaf is actually homotopy invariant. Yeah? So it does land in this, um, this category of cohomology theories. And now it's also clear that if you do this functor and then evaluate it on the point, you recover the space X. Yeah? So this is saying that this left adjoint functor is fully faithful. So now, if you want to show that this adjunction is, a, is an equivalence of categories, um, it remains to show, for, for instance, that this evaluation on the point functor is conservative. So for this, you take uh, morphisms between uh, two cohomology theories, and suppose that it's an isomorphism on the point. And we'd like to show that it's an isomorphism and well, it's very clear how you want to do this and uh, knowing that F and G satisfy these two conditions. So first of all, using homotopy invariance, you see that F is an isomorphism on, on all Euclidean space, Euclidean spaces R to the N from the homotopy invariance property. And then uh, from this, using now the descent property, you can deduce that F is an isomorphism on every manifold M and so, now this implication is not completely trivial, but you can, um, so one way to, to deduce it is using um, the existence of good covers of manifold. Uh, so good cover is, is a cover by uh, copies of Rn such that all the intersections are either empty or again isomorphic to Rn. So. Okay, so this is a, a sketch of the, the proof of this classification theorem. Um, so now what about spectra? So if you space X, um, so, so now, I mean, now we know these cohomology theories are just given by these, these types of uh, functors for some spaces X. 
Now, if the space X is actually uh, the infinite root space of a spectrum, then this cohomology theory, is with, with acquire, this cohomology theory acquires some uh, additional structure. So if, so if E is a spectrum, uh, then, um, This cohomology theory uh, associated with the, the infinite loop space um, has um, additional structure. Um, and well, there's various things you could say about what that is, but uh, for example, it will have some transfers. So it will have, in addition to the contravariant functoriality that it has, it also has some covariant functoriality. Um, for example, uh, you have Hattia duality for compact manifolds, um, which says the following. So if um, M is compact, uh, then if you look at the, it's a suspension spectrum. Uh, it's a dualizable spectrum and it has dual uh, the Tom spectrum of the negative uh, tangent bundle. Okay. Um, right, so from this, you see that if you have a morphism F M to N between uh, compact manifolds, Um, then it induces, uh, so if you take the suspension spectrum and pass the duals, you get um, morphism between these thumb spectra in the other direction. Yes. And so now if you now map this spectra into this uh, spectrum E that you started with, you get now a covariant kind of push forward map yeah, from Cohomology of n, uh, sorry, from cohomology of m to cohomology of n, um, except that it is um, a twisted cohomology. You have this thumb spectra. So, but if you're in a context where uh, the spectrum e is oriented with respect to these types of bundles here, for example, if this is complex oriented and these are complex manifolds, then um, then these uh, thumb spectra are just uh, ordinary shifts. Yeah? So you just get the push forward in cohomology with some with some shift just from a tiered reality. Um, right, so actually uh, there's uh, more general transfers than this, so I just mentioned this because maybe um, a tiered reality is something that uh, most people are familiar with, but um, in fact, you don't need these manifolds to be compact. Yeah? So there's a more general um, more general thing we can say, so more generally, you really only need uh, a relative condition on the morphism F. Yeah, so we need, if the morphism F uh, is proper, you will have a transfer as well. Proper. Um, then, um, right, so I'd like to explain how this transfer arises for a proper morphism like this. Um, and a uh, convenient framework to understand this is to work with sheaves of spectra on these manifolds. So you have the infinity category of sheaves of spectra on M and N. Okay, so SPT means the infinity category of spectra here. And uh, of course you can uh, pull back along F like so and this functor has um, a, right adjoint, a right adjoint, which is the push forward. And when F is proper, the push forward functor itself has a right adjoint, uh, which is usually denoted F upper shriek. Uh, so you have this sequence of adjunctions. Um, and also one defines the relative tangent bundle of this morphism F to be so the difference of the tangent bundle of M and the tangent bundle of N pulled back to F. So this is a virtual vector bundle on M. Uh, so relative 
virtual tangent bundle. Um, and so in this situation, this is a canonical uh, natural transformations, which compares these two pullback functors. You have the upper star pullback and the upper shriek pullback. Um, and there's a canonical transformation from the one to the other. So here this sigma, TF, by this I mean the uh, so suspension by the by this virtual tangent bundle. So this is uh, smashing with the Tom spectrum. So this is some um, so this functor is some um, some automorphism of this category actually, and locally on M is just an ordinary suspension. Yeah, locally on M, where the, the this tangent bundle is trivial, is just ordinary suspension by the rank of the bundle. Um, by uh, globally, it can it could be something different. Um, Okay, so I'm not going to explain um, exactly how to construct this transformation. Um, so this is, uh, well, this takes some work. Uh, um, if F, so in the case where F is like a submersion, it's a proper submersion, in fact, you have an equivalence between these two functors. Um, and then for general F, you can kind of factor it by a closed embedding followed by a submersion. So for the submersion part, we know what to do. And for the, and so, so you reduce the case where F is actually a closed embedding. And in this case, you can use a tubular neighborhood theorem, for example, to reduce to the zero section of a vector bundle. And then you can do some, something, some explicit construction in this, in this case. Um, right, but what I want to explain is how this natural transformation now gives rise to the, this transfer in cohomology. Um, so, Uh, right, so if I look at, so I have my spectrum E and E sub M now means the constant sheet on M uh, with value in the spectrum E. And uh, I, I smash it with the, the storm spectrum. So this is some sheaf of spectra, or some, some locally constant sheaf of spectra on M. Um, And right, and I take is this gamma means the space of global sections of this. So the constant sheaf is of course pulled back from, from N, so I can rewrite this in this way. And now I can use this natural transformation to get a map to gamma M F upper shriek of E N. Um, now I want to use the fact that f of a shriek is right adjoint to something. So I will rewrite, you can rewrite this. So this space of global section is the same as a mapping space from the sphere spectrum over M to this spectrum. And now using the adjunction, so this is where the fact that f is proper is relevant. I mean, otherwise, I mean, this natural transformation exists even if f is not proper. This properness of f is not relevant there, but it is relevant now to define this transfer. Um, so just using the adjunction, now this is the same as um, mapping space from F lower star, F upper star of the sphere to EN. Uh, right, and now I use the unit transformation for this adjunction here. And I go to the mapping space from the sphere to E, and this is, well, I mean, this is the, Gamma N. Uh, so the cohomology of N. Okay, so this composite is this transfer from cohomology of M with this twist here to the cohomology of N. Okay. Um, so you have these kinds of transfer, which are, uh, I mean, very general. They exist for any proper morphism, basically. Um, and so this is basically um, the answer to the, this first question in this topological context. So what kind of transfer do cohomology theories represented by spectra have? Um, now for the second question, do these, can one recover somehow the spectrum structure on, on loops infinity E from these transfers? So, um, 
that means. So we would like to actually recover the deloopings of E. So we have this space loops infinity of E, which has some given deloopings, and these deloopings were used in the construction of these transfers. Uh, but can one recover the deloopings from the transfer? Okay, so you have to be well a bit more precise about what exactly what you mean by this. Um, for instance, um, so if you look at this twisted uh, cohomology space here, if the if the tangent bundle of f is actually positive dimensional, then basically, so for example, if it's just a trivial bundle of some positive rank, then this space here, I mean, involves the delooping of the spectrum d. So of course, so so now, but our goal is to somehow recover the deloopings from the transfers. Yeah, so you cannot. So you are not allowed to consider these transfers if the, the tangent bundle is, is positive dimensional. Um, but so let's think about the situation when the relative tangent bundle is actually of rank zero. And so a special case, um, particularly a nice special case of this is um, if you have a finite covering map. Um, and actually, I will call this the finite tile map. So I'm, by this, I mean a finite covering map, but with the convention, it doesn't have to be subjective. Um, so, well, so this is a proper morphism in particular, and it is such that, so it's also a submersion. So it, actually, it has an actual relative tangent bundle, and this tangent bundle is actually zero. So in this case, uh, we have a canonical transfer. Um, from uh, cohomology of M. To the cohomology of M. But maybe I should, oops. Already in this way, as before, so map, mapping space from M loops infinity E, mapping space from N to loops infinity. Okay. Now, the question, can we recover the deloopings of E from, from this transfer? So the answer is yes. And um, so one way to see how this is going to work is just to consider these special case of this transfer. Well, so I mean, we know that connective spectra are the same thing as, as, as the equivalent to um, spaces with a group-like infinity space structure. Um, and now the point is from these transfers, you can recover this uh, additive infinity space structure. For example, if you consider, well, just take N to be a point and M to be two points as a finite covering map. And if you plug in this, you get, um, yeah, so, Look at this map here. The transfer gives you a map from loops infinity E times loops infinity E to loops infinity. I think this map is the addition on the spectrum. Um, so you can recover the, the additive structure on the spectrum from these transfer maps. And so um, provided that this, if these transfers are encoded in a suitably coherent manner, you will be able to recover the infinity space structure on the spectrum loops infinity of E. And then as we know, um, this recovers, well, the connective, I mean, the deloopings of E as a connective spectrum. Um, right, so let me um, make a precise statement. So I said we need to encode these transfers in a suitably coherent manner in order to recover, um, in particular, this infinity space structure. And I mean, this is a part which kind of classically was uh, difficult to achieve, yeah? So I mean, historically, I think it was, it was more or less clear that the deloopings were determined by the transfers, but people were not able to make this precise, yeah, because they did not have the technology to you know, express the coherence necessary uh, for this to be actually be a true statement. Um, and yeah, so to do this, um, you introduce the category of correspondences, and it's a two category. Category of finite total correspondences. Um, 
So I you know this core finite total manifolds. And so the objects are uh, manifolds, smooth manifolds as before, uh, but the morphisms will now be these correspondences or these spans. Um, so this is a morphism from M to P. And this one here is supposed to be finite total. So the left facing maps are finite total maps. Um, and this is a two category because these morphisms form a groupoid. So if you, for given M and P, you have, you look at the groupoids of all such N over M and P. So you have a group, uh, you have mapping groupoids between two manifolds. So, and these form a two category. Um, right, and then the composition. So if you have two morphisms in a row, what you do is you take the pullback here. Um, so of course the category manifolds doesn't have pull, all pullbacks, so you have to be careful when you do these things, but since this, this map is finite at all here, the pullback exists. Yeah, I mean, this will also be a finite covering map and therefore there's a canonical manifold structure on this pullback, right? And so then this, uh, this big span is a, is a composition by definition. Um, yeah, so this is one of the reasons that we actually restrict to finite et al here, um, because you see from the previous discussion of these transfers, I mean, you would have a transfer like this actually slightly more generally, the map, if you just had um, a proper morphisms here, such that the, the virtual relative tangent bundle is trivialized equal to zero, so this does not have to be finite et al, but you would still have such a transfer. So you could hope to also include these transfers in your category here, but then you run into technical issues because these pullbacks are not going to exist as smooth manifolds. Yeah, so, I mean, you could solve this by, you know, using derived manifolds or something like this, but I'm going to stick with the finite et al situation. Okay, so now that we have this category, we can actually formulate the point theorem um, that, um, well, well, okay. First, first of all, there exists a functor from category of uh, connective spectra. Well, actually, sorry, the functor exists in a category of all spectra to um, category of cohomology theories on manifolds with finite et al transfers. Okay, and what I mean by with finite et al transfers, I really mean that uh, it's a functor on these two category here. Uh, so if you have any spectrum, you send it to this, uh, this cohomology theory, and it has these transfers as we've seen, so you get, well, I mean, part of the statement is you do in fact get such a functor, so this is a coherence result. And then this functor restricts to an equivalence between subcategories on either side. So it restricts to an equivalence between connective spectra on the, on the left hand side and um, ah, and those cohomology theories that are group like. Uh, so what this means, um, so this cohomology with finite et al transfers, as I kind of uh, explained, they actually uh, are automatically, automatically valued in infinity spaces with this, uh, with this kind of additive structure here. And so group-like means that this, this addition should be a group. Yeah? So every, every element has an inverse up to homotopy. Um, Right. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about the kind of classical, um, well, the 
case of ordinary spectra. So I have any questions on this, on this part. When was this theorem first properly stated this way? Um, I mean, the only place where I've seen the statement of this theorem is the, the introduction to uh, our paper on motivic infinite loop spaces. But I mean, it's also justified there with some references. But um, I, I don't think it's appeared in this exact form before. So uh, I guess I should also have commented on this theorem here, which I did not give a attribution for, um, because I'm not really sure. I mean, this has appeared in various forms and in various spaces, and I mean, nobody takes credit for this because, I mean, so this has appears, for example, in the morel Brivotsky paper on A1 homotopy theory, but it's just like an, a five line example, where just, so you just claim this fact, for example. So, yeah. Um, and this one about spectra, uh, yeah, maybe this one is, is less, uh, is less, yeah, this may maybe not exactly well known, so to speak. So I don't really have a reference, sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, let's move on to, uh, Motivic spectra. I will ignore now the, the second question about this kind of recognition principle here. Just focus on the first question, which is what transfers exist in cohomology theory represented by motivic spectra? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so a notation um, would you note S H of S infinity category of motivic spectra over S. Um, so we have kind of the six operations on this uh, system of categories as S varies. Uh, in particular, we have this uh, adjunction, pullback, push forward, and uh, compactly supported push forward with the right adjoint of shriek. Um, so we have this kind of two adjunction. The second one, at least if F is um, separated of finite type. And just remind you, this, these shriek functors are such that, um, right, so F upper shriek is F upper star if F is a tal. And then F lower shriek is F lower star if F is proper. All right, and this basically determines this adjunction because every morphism can be factored uh, as an open embedding into a proper. I mean, every morphism can be compactified, every separated morphism of finite type. And so one, in fact, uses this then to define this, this functor. Uh, yeah. So in the case of smooth manifold, you have transfer for any proper morphisms. And you know, so you could, if you're optimistic, you would hope that the same would be true in this context, but there's one uh, key difference between this scheme case and the manifold case is that in the manifold case, well, every manifold is smooth. Yeah. So somehow, case of schemes, now we also have non-smooth non schemes around if we want. And um, morphism between smooth schemes are very far from being, you know, arbitrary morphisms. In particular, they always local complete intersection. And it turns out this is the, the kind of maximal generality in which these transfers will exist. And they be for morphisms that are local complete intersections. Uh, so somehow in the, in the manifold case, every morphism between smooth manifolds is a local complete intersection. And so that, I mean, the notion does not exist. So. Um, yeah, so let me uh, define this notion first, so uh, morphism, so this is the standard definition, the morphism of schemes, F x to S is a local complete intersection. Uh, 
abbreviated LCI if um, so locally on X it factors as um, So it factors as a composite I and P where I is closed, uh, closed immersion, which is uh, locally cut out by your regular sequence. Uh, so this is called the regular closed immersion and P is smooth. Uh, right, so locally on X, so there's an open cover of X where these morphism factors in this way. Um, Mark? Yeah. There's a question for you in the chat. Oh, sorry, I, I don't have the chat in view. Uh, ah, okay. Does LCI imply compactify compactifiability? Um, no, it does not. Um, so no, in general, this factorization like this may not exist globally on X. Yeah, so I mean, there's an obvious notation in the definition. This X is really not X, it's some member of some open color of X. Um, Right, and so for any um, such local complete intersections, we can define this uh, virtual tangent, relative tangent bundle. Um, and well, this is not going to be a valid definition, but I'll define this as, um, so you, P is smooth, so P has a tangent bundle T of P, or I can pull it back to X and then subtract uh, the normal bundle of I. So I being a closed immersion, which is cut out by a regular sequence, implies that it has a normal bundle. It is a local, uh, finite locally free sheet. Um, so this, uh, we got this as a virtual vector bundle, so an element in the K theory of X. And of course, uh, it is not valid definition because it depends on a factorization like this, but in fact, uh, it does not. Yes, yeah, so one can show, I mean, even doesn't have to exist such a factorization. I mean, more canonical definition would be to take the cotangent complex of this morphism, which will be a perfect complex on X, and every perfect complex on X defines a point in, in K theory. So, but for practical purposes, you know, this definition suffices often. Mm. Okay, and now, okay, we have the following theorem. So this is due to degrees, Jin, Nikan, and this is, uh, well, it's not so much of a theorem, it's more of a construction, actually. So if um, F, X to S is LCI, and here I do have to assume that it admits a global factorization as above. Um, so then there exists a canonical transformation, natural transformation, um, exactly as before, so sigma C F F upper star to F upper shriek. All right, so again, this is this means smashing with the Tom spectrum of these virtual vector bundles on X. Uh, so I will, yeah, okay, so I think I have time to sketch uh, this construction, so. I didn't do in the case of manifolds, but if you want, you can kind of uh, you can do do this also in the case of manifolds, more or less. 
Um, so the way this goes is, well, first of all, uh, assume that f is smooth. Well, so if f is smooth, then um, there's a stronger statement, which is that there's a canonical isomorphism between these two functors. Uh, this is uh, due to Vyvodsky and Ayub. Um, right, so this is already uh, kind of difficult, uh, difficult theorem here, uh, but uh, it's just a well-known, uh, well-known feature, I suppose, of uh, stable motivic chemotherapy theory. And um, right now, because you have this global factorization, you can uh, suffices to to deal with the case of a smooth morphism and the case of a closed immersion of a regular closed immersion. Yeah, I have this factorization like, like this. Um, so suppose now that F is in fact uh, closed immersion uh, X into B as above. Closed immersion, so LCI closed immersion. Um, and then, um, so this is kind of the the new part in this, the construction of Degli's gene and Khan. So they use a deformation to the normal bundle to define this natural transformation. Um, deformation. To the normal bundle. Um, so deformation to the normal bundle, so it's a scheme, uh, D X D. Uh, it's a scheme which sits over A1, um, uh, in fact, A1 over B even. And so you should think of this as a, as a deformation parameterized by A1. And if you look at uh, the zero, so over zero, you pull this back, you get the normal bundle of I. Close immersion here. So the normal value of i, which maps to v via, well, uh, that's why it maps to x. It's a vector bundle of x, and then x embeds into v. Um, and then the other, all the other fibers, so if you restrict this to the open complement, um, then in fact, uh, it's an isomorphism of the open complement. So you have a pullback square like so. Um, right, so this is a family over A1, which is the fiber is V everywhere, but when you get to zero, it becomes the normal bundle of this image. So this is what the deformation to the normal bundle construction. Uh, so this is a standard thing to use in intersection theory. One uses this to um, find intersections of cycles and things like that. Um, right. Yeah, so actually, maybe let me actually go into a bit more details of how this construction goes now. So I'm gonna give names to all these maps here, T, U. Um, so everything here sits over V. Um, it's Q, this is the immersion I that we studied with, this the projection of this bundle, let's go with Pi, and then we also need this map here, all this P, composite map. <laughs> Um, so we have this uh, open closed pair here, and so this gives rise to a localization triangle. Um, You have a shriek. So this is a co-fiber sequence of, of functors, um, of endofunctors of SH over this deformation. And uh, so the interesting part is when I consider connecting homomorphism. It goes to T lower star T upper shriek shifted by one. And so this connective, this connecting homomorphism is what 
gives rise to all these specialization maps uh, from uh, generic fiber to special fiber. Uh, so we want to use this. And then the other ingredient is um, the fact that over, well, over GM, uh, well, maybe I should say, okay. in, let's say in SH or over GM, uh, there's a canonical map from the zero sphere to GM. And so I mean, such a map, I mean, you get such a map by choosing a unit in your vertebral function on your base. I mean, in general, there's no canonical choice, but of course with GM, GM carries a universal unit. So you have this kind of, yeah, so this is universal unit. Uh, right, so I mean, this is really the GM, yeah. So this is GM over GM. In, yeah, pointed GM uh, over GM. Um, okay, so I can suspend this once to get the map from the sphere, from, from the circle to S1 slash GM. And this is, uh, this is the Tom space of the trivial line bundles. T. Um, right. Okay, so now I can tell you what this transformation is in the case of this closed immersion. So we, we want, um, so for closed immersion, the virtual tangent bundle is a negative of the normal bundle. Oh. And we want a natural transformation like this. And or by adjunction, it's a matter from the identity to I lower star, sigma and I, I upper shriek. And this is what I'm going to define now by composing various things. So I start with identity, actually, I'm gonna shift it by one. So this is the identity on SH of B. And now I'm gonna use this special map that I have over GM. So over this GM here. Uh, so this is a map from Q lower star. Um, sigma T, so smash with T and uh, Q upper star. So this is just by adjunction obtained from this map here over this GM. All right, and now in this construction, I, we actually use this uh, equivalence here several times. So here I'm gonna use it for GM itself. So GM, this morphism here is a smooth morphism. So I have this equivalence for Q. And uh, of course the tangent bundle of GM is, is trivial. Um, so this, this thing is just the Q upper shriek. Right, and now I use this big diagram here to rewrite. So this morphism Q here is the same as this, so I can decompose it in this way. Yeah. So this gives me um, lower star U, lower star U upper shriek, the upper shriek. Um, and now I use this connecting homomorphism here to go to uh, Either we start the upper shriek, the upper shriek, but now it's shifted by one again. Um, and now, so we have T, P, and now this composite is the same as this composite here, yeah? pi and then I. So, uh, so this equivalent to this, and now for this composite, I use again the fact that pi is smooth. So this pi upper, uh, upper shriek is the same as pi uh, upper star up to a twist by the tangent bundle of pi. And I also use homotopy invariants. So homotopy invariants, because this is a vector bundle, so this is the only place where we actually use this. I mean, so far, everything we did would work for an arbitrary closed immersion here. This would be the, the normal cone of that immersion. And I use the facts of vector bundle. So by homotopy invariants, I know that the pullback along this pi is actually a free faithful function. Um, so in conclusion, this composite is actually just a twist by the normal one of pi.
All right. And now this composite, well, you remove this one here. So this composite here is, is, what, is what we wanted to define this natural transformation. All right. Um, and then, of course, you define it in the case of moves and case closed immersion. Uh, still, uh, you still have to check a bunch of things. So you have to check, for instance, that it's independent of the factorization. Um, and of course, you also want to prove a bunch of other things. This should be compatible with composing these Fs as well, and so on. So, so anyway, they do all of these things. So, um, okay. But now, the, now that we have this natural transformation, we can define the transfer exactly as before. Yeah? So, let me set up some notation for this. Notation. Um, so if I have some matrix spectrum over some S, some morphism F X to S, um, and some K3 class C. So really, uh, this is really the K3 space of X. Um, so yeah, so any kind of point in this K3 space defines this self equivalence of the category I write sigma C uh, right so yeah, again locally on x when x is trivial there's just an ordinary uh, suspension by some trivial um, by the Tom space of some trivial bundle and in general is a twisted version of this Okay, so the notation I want to introduce with this, this data is the following. So ex comma c. So this is going to be the quick c, c twisted um, cohomology of x with coefficients in e. So it may not be the best notation for this, but it's, uh, I mean, it's uh, the simplest one, I think. <laughs> so I, by this means the mapping space in sh of x from sphere spectrum over x um, to this C suspension of the pullback of E to x. And I regard this, um, I regard this as a mapping space. I mean, you could also regard it as a spectrum because it's, you have a mapping spectrum as well, but just regard it as a space for now. Um, yeah, so for example, I mean, just to um, compare this with more classical notation, so if, C is just uh, the integer n in the K3 group, um, then, right, then the sigma C functor is the sigma 2n comma n functor in, in standard notation. And so, um, and then so the homotopy groups of this space, in this case, would be uh, E 2n minus i n. So they would be these groups. Okay. Um, I guess another example, um, some specific E, so if, if E is equal to KGL, then um, this is just always uh, isomorphic to the homotopy K3 of X. In particular, this does not depend on C, so this is a, um, manifestation of this algebraic about periodicity, if you, if you want. Um, and uh, another example is suppose E is a motivic homology spectrum, HD, um, X smooth over a field or even a DVR. And um, in this case, this space is equivalent to uh, blocks cycle complex, so the underlying space of block cycle complex uh, in co-dimension R, where R is the rank of the block. All right. So yeah, so generally, I mean, this is an instance of the fact that if you have a cohomology theory which is uh, oriented, like uh, HZ or KGL also, 
and this, this twist actually only depends on the rank. Um, okay. okay, so now the, let's go back to the general situation. We have this natural transformation. Um, for a LCI morphism, uh, maybe okay. So if now let let me assume now that F is proper and LCI, um, so then this natural transformation will induce a transfer from commodity of X. Um, with the twist by this virtual tangent bundle. And I mean, you could have some auxiliary twist around as well. So you have a transfer like this to the cohomology of S. You see like so C is just some arbitrary element in the K theory of S. Yeah, so, so F goes, of course, oops. Yeah, I wanted to write F, so F goes from X to S. Just as a reminder. Okay. Uh, all right, so this is a kind of transfers that you have in the cohomology represented by matrix spectrum. Of course, if you pick a specific matrix spectrum E, you might have uh, even more transfers than these. Yeah. For example, uh, for the SKGL case, we know that in, in, in K theory, homotopy K theory, you have even more transfer. You're going to have a push forward for any you know, proper morphism um, of finite toy dimension, for example, which is more general than SCI. But um, if you want an answer which works for every spectrum, for every motivic spectrum P, then this is the, this is the most general answer. Um, right. So, in conclusion, let me actually say um, one last thing. So, maybe for people that are familiar with derived geometry. So, uh, well, you, you can actually push this a bit further. Um, yeah, so if, so even more generally, uh, if F, if you just have a proper morphism, by the way, so if, if it's not LCI, well, it doesn't induce this, this transfer, but what you can do is you can choose a derived scheme structure on X, which is LCI for S. Uh, so, I mean, suppose, suppose that you have uh, a derived structure X there on X, which is uh, LCI, or I mean, the derived world one says quasi-smooth uh, over S. Um, then, so, I mean, everything that I said works, I mean, goes through for derived schemes, basically. I mean, you can do all of the materi in that context. And then um, a theorem of um, Adil Khan is that if you do this, then um, when you take a cohomology theory like this, then in fact, this cohomology theory depends only on the underlying classical scheme. So even if X is a derived scheme here, this does not depend on the derived structure. Um, on the other hand, you will now have from this X there, LCI or S, you will have an induced transfer. Um, which now is twisted by the virtual tangent bundle of this derived enhancement. Um, like this. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just a side remark I wanted to point out that um, so you can, so, I mean, this is one reason might be interested in you know derived geometry is that it gives this guy of um, of transfer so I mean this is uh, the theory of virtual fundamental classes here um, and uh, basically for any proper morphism at least for any projective morphism um, there always will exist some derived structure which is LCI or S yeah. so we can always define some transfer depending on a choice of derived structure Sorry, do you know a uh, reference for where we uh, show that that uh, derived structure that's quasi-smooth always exists? 
Um, I'm not sure if that's true for general propamorphisms. Um, but if it's projective, you can, I mean, if it's quasi-projective, it's just cut out by some equation and some projective thing. Um, in some in something smooth, yeah. I mean, is anything that's cut out by equation in some something smooth has a has a quasi smooth derived enhancement because you can just take the same equations and then regard the regard them as defining a, a derived subscheme, and this is always quasi smooth. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Well, if it's if it's projective, then you can. Uh, well, if it's projective in the in the Hartshorn sense at the very least, then this is always possible. Yes. If some derived structure, of course, is. There's going to be more than one. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, that's uh, all I wanted to say for today. So I'll stop here. Hey, thank you very much, Mark. Maybe we can all unmute and give uh, Mark a big round of applause. So maybe we have some questions from the audience. Please go ahead. Uh, I guess I've got one. So, so what is the uh, I guess most generality that you can expect to have transfers uh, like in the fully derived setting? So, like uh, including all all of the hypotheses. Um, in the derived setting, it would be, I mean, it'd be the same. It would be proper LCI or quasi-smooth. Mm -hmm. I guess this whole construction, this whole construction is supposed to work uh, basically, you know, mutatis mutandis. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Wouldn't it be would it be unreasonable to expect to have transfer maps also for finely presented drives maps? I mean, when you're a perfect cotangent complex, so you have a virtual vector bundle. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's unreasonable, but it, I mean, you don't know where to start to define the transfer. I guess. So you, you would need some, some brand new idea, I guess, to figure out how to define a transfer in this case. Well, I think, I mean, you could do the, this definition of normal code. I mean, you know, there's this stacky version where you can deform to a vector bundle stack. Ah, yes. And you could also, I think you could do that also when you have a, something which is not quasi smooth, but only, I mean, a perfect cotangent complex. You would end up with a higher vector bundle stack as a special fiber. Which would have, uh, I mean, you, the only thing you will need is the what you this thing that, I mean, pi upper shriek, pi lower star gives you um, smashing with, with the. I mean, well, now this issue with this is that then this deformation is now stacked, and that that is an issue because. No, you you would have you would have to do develop, develop all the machinery for for high stacks and so on. Yeah, but this does not work for metric integrity theory. That's the problem. I mean, it yep. would work for something like some metal local theory or something like that. Right. And then, presumably, then, then this would work, yeah. But, but it's also for very special stacks. I mean, these are kind of like vector bundle stacks. So, well, how yeah. do you think it um, Yeah, I mean, actually, so Adil and I have thought about this, uh, this, uh, this strategy uh, to define this. Um, fundamental classes in this case, but it's, there are some, we were not able to, to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's very tricky to make sense of SH of stacks. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, that, I, I'm not ruling out that it's, yeah, I, it might still be possible. Yeah. I mean, I would not be so surprised. Okay, great. More, any more questions? Uh, I guess if nobody else has one, I, I'll ask another one. Um, so uh, uh, Halpern, Leisner, and somebody else have, have this notion of being a formally proper map and it's sort of like uh, you have the properness part in terms of you know cohomology. Uh, is that actually good enough here or, or do you really actually need 
the true properness. Um, I mean, the only thing that you need is that the, the so the zero is canonical comparison map between uh, lower shriek and lower star. And you just need that map to be an equivalence. I mean, you need to take the inverse of this map to find the transform. Hmm. So, I mean, if you have some non-proper morphisms, which happens to have the property that the lower shriek and lower star coincide, then it's, then it's okay. But um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a class of morphism where you can actually expect this. I never really thought about that. Hmm. That seems that seems like a lot of actually. I'm not, no. I have a question. So, uh, Ulrich Bunke here. So, I mean, I was thinking about mostly about this manifold case, of course, but I mean, there for the transfers, uh, the homotopy invariant is not absolutely necessary. So, there are many cases where you have these transfers uh, also in the non homotopy invariant situation. So, the whole important is homotopy invariant. Non homotopy invariant situation. Um, So what exactly do you mean by this? I mean, in the manifold case, if you just uh, somehow don't require homotopy invariant, you still have transfers, at least for certain sheets of spectra. Uh, you have still the sheet, but uh, yeah. no longer homotopy invariant. And so I mean, this construction of transfer that I find here would work. I mean, you see that this EM can be replaced by any uh, well, any, you can start with any sheaf on N. It doesn't have to be constant. Yeah. You have a transfer. So you actually do get a transfer in, in cohomology with non-constant coefficients from this construction. Yeah, this, this one here could be, could be any sheaf, right? But, uh, sorry, I don't know sorry to, Mark, sorry to have interrupted you. And if I clearly remember, if you don't put uh, the relation on homotopy invariance for manifolds, you won't recover topological spaces, I think. Oh, that's true also, yeah, of course. But uh, yeah, yeah, but somehow, I mean, this construction is- Excision plus, excision plus real line. Otherwise you won't recover topological spaces. Yeah, yeah, this is true. But I mean, I can still consider this construction for any, if you have any proper morphisms between manifold and any sheaf of spectra on N, I can do this construction. So it gives me a transfer in, in cohomology with non-constant coefficients, which, uh, I, mean, I, have a, I have a question. Um, how much, how, how, how independent of the choice of the point C in, in the K theory space is this map? Is it sort of like a, a function of pi naught of K of X or what? No, it's not a function of pi naught. No, it's, it's, uh, it's fully functorial in, in the K theory space. U does an infinity group for it. So it's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't depend on any given truncations of a K3 space. Um, yeah, so in fact, you have an action of the whole, uh, I guess. So on this space here, you're gonna have an action of the loop, of the loop space at this point, yeah. Uh, this will act on this. So this is an E1 group. Um, so it, it really depends, yeah. So you cannot just uh, think about K3 classes uh, in this context. I mean, you see the case, of course, that this, I mean, the I mean, up to homotopy, this space only depends on the K3 class of C. But, but it's functorial in C. So if you have a path from C to C prime in the K3 space, you get an induced equivalence between these spaces. But it depends on the path. Thank does you. This, does this answer the question? <laughs> So if it's if it's fibered over um, over the whole K theory space, which is uh, an E infinity space, does that mean that uh, you have a way of taking these mapping spaces or or, or I guess objects of these uh, mapping spaces and uh, and sort of uh, 
adding them uh, in different fibers, like into the sum of the, into the fiber over the sum. So like, do you get like a higher mm -hmm. sort of uh, a day convolution structure or something? So, I mean, for this, you would need a multiplicative structure on P, I believe. Mean, if E is a ring spectrum, then yes, you will have you know, the car product will behave like this. Hmm. If you have a class, if you, if you have a C twisted class and a C prime twisted class, yeah, the product will be a C plus C prime twisted class. But the sum, I mean, this thing itself is that for the additive structure, this is already an infinity space by itself. Yeah? So the additive structure lives over each value. Oh, okay. Thanks. Okay, let's check once more. Maybe some more questions. Okay, doesn't seem to be the case. Then. Um, I want to, of course, thank Mark for a wonderful lecture and also all the attendees for, for, for attending the talk and for all your wonderful questions. So, thanks. Thank and uh, please come back tomorrow. Mark's next, next talk tomorrow, uh, same time, same place. When is the third talk? Monday. On Monday? On Monday, yeah. Uh, oh, till 2 okay. PM, I think. All right, thanks. So yeah. long. Okay, see you then. I'm a clean father. <laughs> <laughs>